So Duncan, why should we hire you for this position? Well, because... I have never been late to work. Because... I am a dedicated employee. Because... I have got an employee of a month three separate times. I have... The highest amount of sales on the floor. What's going on guys? This is Poger coming at you with another video. So this is actually a game I've been wanting to talk about for a very long time now. Quad Run on the Atari 2600. This is actually one of the rarest games on the console ever made. So what's so special about it, right? Well, it's actually one of the first games to actually have a voice during the gameplay. Now that doesn't mean anything now, but back then it was actually extremely difficult to get a real human's voice in a video game. So I want to talk about it a little bit and I'm going to go over the history as well of voices in video games. Let's start from the beginning. In the late 70s and early 80s, games didn't have as much personality. You usually controlled a spaceship of some kind on a black background. The rest was up to your imagination. But as more games were released, this started to change. In Pac-Man, for an example, you don't play as a spaceship. Instead, you control an abstract shape with human-like characteristics, and the ghosts have names, too. When you complete a set number of stages, a cutscene plays. In Donkey Kong, Nintendo took things even further by having an actual storyline. Here, you have to save Pauline from captivity. At this point, games were starting to tell a story with characters, plots, and cutscenes, almost like a movie. Looking for a way to innovate, Sunsoft created a fixed shooter called Stratovox where you have to save astronauts from UFOs that are invading the planet. The game itself is nothing special, but it was revolutionary for one specific reason. It was the first game ever made to feature voice synthesis. A game that actually talks to the player is unbelievable. As you can hear, the voice is a bit hard to understand, and there's only a few short voice samples in the game. Three months later, Stern Electronics came out with Berserk, which took voices in video games to a whole new level. The voices here are much clearer, and there's quite a few more lines than in Stratovox. <laughs> But here's the problem. A real human's voice sample takes up a lot of read-only memory. Back then, the only way to fit a human's voice into a game was to compress it down. Even then, the voice alone could take up a decent percentage of the game's total read-only memory allowance. For an example, the iconic Sega voice in the first Sonic the Hedgehog took an astonishing one-eighth of the game's total read-only memory. Sega! This game came out over a decade after Stratovox and Berserk, but the example still works. Voice compression was so expensive back then, each word in Berserk cost a thousand bucks. And there was 30 words in that game, so that's approximately $30,000 spent in order to have this game with a real human voice. Imagine having to pay a thousand bucks for each word that comes out of your mouth. Our numbers have been fantastic this month, so with that said, please give our CEO our undivided attention. Thanks, Duncan. Anyway... What I think... Now, due to the success of Berserk in the arcades, the game was ported to the Atari 2600. While it does look and play very well compared to its arcade counterpart, due to the limitations of the 2600, the voice samples were unfortunately removed. While a human's voice is seemingly impossible on the 2600, its competitor, Mattel, thought otherwise for its own console, the Intellivision. The Intellivision came out two years after the 2600 with better graphics and hardware, the idea of adding voices to games would only make the console stand out even more. 
However, because the cartridges only supported 4K of read-only memory, it would be extremely difficult to fit a voice in the game, so they created the IntelliVoice. This was a separate peripheral that you plugged into the Intellivision. The IntelliVoice device contained 2K worth of various generic words that could be combined to make phrases. This made it easier overall so that the games that supported the IntelliVoice didn't have to dedicate as much ROM space to the voices. Mattel Electronics presents Space Spartans. Hello Commander, computer reporting. Repair on. Unfortunately, the IntelliVoice was a market failure for a few different reasons. For starters, the voice data took a lot of ROM space, so companies had to manufacture larger ROM chips, which increased costs. Sure, compressing the voice data saved some space here and there, but the voice clarity would drop, making the narrator sound goofy. 74405 Wow, he certainly sounds charming. Imagine a voice like that in real life. So, Christine, if you're not doing anything this weekend, do you want to go on a date with me? The other problem, the IntelliVoice was expensive. It was $100 for the device, and you still had to buy the game separately. Speaking of games, only 5 games total were compatible with the IntelliVoice. Imagine buying this and only being able to use 5 games with it. Unfortunately for Mattel, the IntelliVoice didn't sell very well. Initially around 300,000 orders were placed for it, but most of them ended up sitting on retailer shelves. So there were a couple arcade games that had digitized voices that were pretty cool, but in the home console market it seemed like voices in video games were either impossible or impractical. So it's pretty much a wrap then, right? Recently joining Atari in 1982, Steve Wieda was interested in experimenting with the Atari 2600 hardware. He wanted to see what the console was capable of. In order to test it out, he began working on his first game for the 2600, Quad Run. Wieda referred to Quad Run as an exercise to see what he could do with the 2600. For an example, in the game, you will notice a rainbow-like colorization in the levels. He did this in order to test out the color palette on the 2600. This game is also one of the very few to actually have a title screen. Most early 2600 games didn't have a title screen in order to save ROM space, but there was one major innovation this game pulled off that no other console game ever had before. It was the first time a voice was featured in a console game without the need of an extra peripheral. In between levels, the voice will increase in speed. And by the time you reach the later levels, the voice will sound almost unrecognizable. So how did Steve pull this off? Well, it wasn't easy. Quad Run used a cartridge with 8K of ROM space. This was more than most 2600 games at the time, but still not a lot to work with, especially when including a voice in the game. The voice was actually Wida's own voice. He worked with another programmer to get the voice data down to 700 bytes. This may seem like a low number, but that was close to one eighth of the game's total ROM space. What made the voice easier to include in the game was that Wida repeated the same voice clip in the game numerous times, so there was really only one word that was included inside the game's data. In earlier examples like the IntelliVoice, the games were saying full sentences, which take up a lot more data. Wida also explained during an interview that he had to make the screen go black during the voice clip because it used up all the available memory. So what is this game? I'm not even sure what genre it would go under. It's so unique, I'd guess I'd call it a shooter. Anyway, you must protect the planet against various enemies. The enemies are going to have different names. The goons, for an example, just move up and down. These guys, which the game refers to as snags, shrink their body down so they become harder to shoot. Now, each new stage is going to introduce a new enemy with a new gimmick. 
When you complete all the levels, you reach what's referred to as the Weedah Wave, where the game stops telling you which enemy is about to appear on screen, and instead surprises you. What's interesting is that you only get one bullet. When you shoot your only bullet, you have to catch it on the other side of the screen. If you fail to catch your bullet, or if you run into an enemy, you lose a life. So that's a little weird, right? The fact that you have to manage your ammunition actually makes this a challenging game. In most shooters, I love to spam a bunch of bullets, but here, you really can't do that. So before you reach Weedah Wave, the game does a good job introducing each enemy one by one. It will tell you the name of each enemy before you start the level, and you'll learn quickly what ability that particular enemy has. Then, when you reach Weedah Wave, you're on your own. You gotta remember which enemy does what just by looking at them. Sometimes the game gets frustrating because you don't know whether the enemy will come on the top of the screen or from the bottom. So sometimes you might get hit by an incoming enemy because your reaction time isn't fast enough. The controls definitely take some getting used to. The top and the bottom rooms are easy to switch between, just tap the joystick up or down. But the two horizontal rooms are sometimes tricky to maneuver around. You have to move your ship off screen in order to migrate to the nearest horizontal room. When you move between rooms, the game will automatically place you in the middle. That I don't like. Sometimes there might be an enemy there and it could get you killed. But outside of a few control issues, this is actually a really underrated 2600 game. Even though Wii used this game as an exercise to test out the hardware, this ended up being a fun and addictive shooter. I also like the variety. For example, when you reach Wii Wave, all the sounds will change. Before the game was released, it went through playtesting to see how the audience liked the game. Unfortunately for Wida, the feedback was not good. During an interview, Wida stated, When we focus tested the game, it tested too hard. The focus group consisted of mainly 10-12 to 12 year old girls. I have no idea why our marketing department used this demographic. It was a shooting game. I stressed so hard that we must do another test with the correct demographic, but the cost would have been too high. The girls kept saying, it's not like Ms. Pac-Man, so armed with this brilliant information, our marketing gurus figured this game was just too hard. Because of how poorly this game did during playtesting, Atari only released this game exclusively via mail order to members of the Atari Fan Club, which was a magazine subscription service. Only 10,000 copies of this game exist, making it one of the rarest Atari 2600 games ever made. So, what actually was the first game with a voice? Well, that would be Stratavox, and then Berserk came shortly after and improved on that concept. The first talking home console is the Intellivision, but it required an extra add-on, so does that really count? With some help from an ambitious programmer, we got an underrated Atari 2600 game that, for the first time ever, without the need of an extra peripheral, has something to say. Before I end it here, I wanted to say thanks to a few people that made this video possible. Special thanks goes to Atari Protos. I've actually been using their site for years, and they have great information on prototypes for various 2600 games. The Dot Eaters for info about the Intellivision. Brett Wise Words for their general info about Steve Wida. Atari Compendium for their interview with Steve Wida. And most of all, Steve Wida himself for pushing the 2600 to its limits and trying something that no one else has ever done before and making a decent game on top of that. So Duncan. Nope. Nope. I don't like it. So Duncan, why should we hire you for this position? No.
try again. So with that said, please give our CEO our undivided attention. Take two. So with that said, please give our CEO our undivided attention. So with that said, please let our CEO... No. 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 Bad. So with that said, I will... I will what? I don't know. I don't know why I always freeze up on these parts. So with that said, please let our CEO take over.